so good evening uh, and welcome to General Council of February 22nd. Uh, I'll first begin on our agenda with identifying any media on the line. Uh, Victoria Gray from the Turtle Island News. Donna Dirk from evening. Two Row Times. Good evening, Donna. Nice to see you ladies and have you join us. Uh, looking to then following uh, the agenda, uh, I will look to any uh, changes, additions, or deletions to the agenda. I have some. I do. Sure. I Helen? have natural gas. I have a uh, six line road and Iroquois Lodge. Anything further? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, is there a motion to adopt the agenda with those three additions moved by Sherry Lynn's seconder? Malba. Second by Malba. Thank you, ladies. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, we do have uh, three delegations joining us uh, this evening. Uh, I'll first uh, start with our uh, Grand Erie District School Board delegation, uh, who will be making a presentation in relation to the Education Service Agreement. Uh, there is a recommendation on your agendas. Uh, so I will look to, I see, is that Dr. Joanna or Robin? Who will be speaking on behalf of Grand Erie? I think at some point, uh, we if I may, we'll turn it over to Claudine. Okay, perfect. Nice to see you, Joanna. Nice to see you, Claudine, okay. and everybody joining from Grand Erie. <laughs> I'll pass the floor right over to yourself. Okay. Um, yao goa, say go so go. Um, yao go na dogo na yung gets. Uh, thanks for inviting us, and we're happy to pre make this presentation to you. Uh, this is probably about the 40th presentation this council has received. And in spite of all the difficulties surrounding um, our work during the pandemic, I think we've done a pretty good job. Uh, so with us tonight is uh, Dr. Joanna Roberto, who's the Director of Education at Grand Erie. And we have Kevin Graham, who is uh, the lead um, supervisory officer for um, Indigenous education. And we have Robin Stotts, who you probably all know, um, who is the new principal leader for Indigenous education at Grand Erie. And we have Jeannie Martin, who uh, is, now I don't, I don't know her exact title, but she's responsible for the Six Nations students um, and carrying out what what happens in this education agreement. So I will turn it over to the next person. And I believe Joanna. Thank you so much. Miao and thank you for having us here. Uh, we are honored uh, to be here, to be with you, to be of service and to support you. And I, I do wanna say thank you uh, to Chief Hill for uh, not only your friendship, but the opportunity to, to always connect with you and for you to be available to us because that makes a, a huge difference to us as we move forward together. Uh, I wanna thank our staff this evening and the commitment of, of the work that the staff at Grand Erie has put forth and uh, to the students and the families and our partners for their ongoing efforts. We know that uh, this has been a really difficult time for all of us and uh, our commitment and our gratitude to Six Nations for your ongoing support um, is greatly appreciated. I also want to be clear this evening that we continue to improve when it comes to, uh, and you'll see this later on this evening, credit accumulation for Six Nations students, as well as improvements in our uh, quadmester and credit accumulation. I want to personally and professionally note that uh, my commitment uh, to the students of Six Nations is, is present in all the work that I do uh, through the team 
and that um, the opportunity for us to be con committed and to provide you with a comprehensive plan is part of our work. And in fact, this year, we launched the annual learning operating plan for a five-year multi-year strategic plan. And our focus is learn, lead, and inspire. And we hope that we do that with you and we model that at all times. In fact, we did provide you with a copy of that document and you will note, and it'll be spoken to you a little bit later in our presentation, our commitment to Indigenous education that is clearly um, indicated and articulated in our uh, first year of our five-year uh, strategic plan. I wanna also share that I'm very encouraged by the impact and the activities already happening um, that we bring not only in our annual operating plan, but the opportunity that I see in the work that uh, Jeannie does, uh, as well as Robin and our new superintendent, Kevin Graham, in his work and his efforts as we support our students across the district. And most importantly, we're supporting students Six Nations. And finally, I wanna say thank you to Claudine. Uh, Claudine, sometimes we don't get the opportunity to say this in a public forum, but you have been an exceptional uh, leader, a mentor. Uh, I say this confidently in this space. Uh, Chief Phil, she's been exceptional uh, for me as a new director in Grand Erie, for me to be connected and for me to hear all of the, all of the, the pieces that the council and uh, the people of Six Nations have shared about what they wanna see and how we wanna support students. And so I thank you for your guidance. I thank you for your teachings, uh, for your counsel, and for always being there when I need some support and some information, and most importantly, for keeping us connected. So I thank you for your partnership. Thank you. I guess that's my my cue. Sego sawagwego, jishkogo ne yangets, yayak nations de wanadonyo. For those of you who probably know me already on the call, um, I'm the system principal leader of Indigenous education and equity. And I must say, when taking that very big leap, leap and joining the ship in Grand Erie, uh, I took a very big what I feel is a risk in joining the Grand Dairy team. But after being there for a very short time, I was very moved by the actions of the Indigenous education team and all of the things that they have already um, put in place prior to my coming on board. And with the people who are on the call tonight, you have some true allies of uh, Six Nations and the surrounding communities uh, Joanna is there immediately when you want her support and advice and Kevin constantly being involved in our education and our programming and Claudine and I have been I like to use this word we say and this comes from Christine Bibi one of Christine Bibi one of my co-workers are co-conspiring and um Claudine's always got some good advice for things and I look forward to the plans that are ahead and with our pro with our um, presentation tonight Kevin and I will share with you the past year of events with through this education service agreement and a lot of the things that are planned for the future and I look forward to this journey together now we'll go over to you Kevin wonderful thank you very much and good evening to all of you uh, I don't think I've, I've had the pleasure to meet uh, all of you in person, at least, and to at least get a chance to be able to see you on screen is an honor. Uh, as was mentioned previously, uh, I am a superintendent responsible for supporting Indigenous education from K to 12, and I must say it is one of my favorite parts of uh, my portfolio and being able to work with the incredible team uh, in my short period of time, I've been able to see the countless hours and support that they put in to support the students across the Grand Area District School Board and support specifically the students of Six Nations. And so I'm very honored to be able to work alongside an amazing team that truly put students first. And when we think about that as a cliche, sometimes I see it every day in action. So for today, uh, or for this evening, I should say, uh, what we'd like to be able to do is to walk through an overview of the education service agreement. And so I've got a couple slides uh, as Robin had alluded to already, 
we're going to go back and forth in terms of highlighting some of the pieces that you'll see in the education service agreement just to provide a little bit of context. Uh, and so for this first slide that I have for you right now, this is just giving an overview then on hopefully what Robin and I can walk through for all of you, give you a little bit of that context of last school year. So the 2021 school year, a summary of some activities, uh, credit achievement data, Link this, of course, to Grand Erie's multi-year strategic plan, which supports Indigenous students progressing towards graduation. Uh, and then as well, take a look at some recent credit achievement data, of which uh, we have already seen an increase this year in our credit achievement data. And I think that's important to note, and you'll hear me just in the next slide talking about the context of last year, uh, but already this year, we've seen, a, seen an increase in improvement of student achievement. In fact, uh, even our grade 12 students at the end of quadmester one uh, had a 71% credit completion rate, which is uh, phenomenal uh, when you see the data that's coming up next. But we've seen that increase already this year, uh, which is a true testament to the hard work of the students and then as well the school teams that are supporting them every day in schools and online. So for, for a summary then that you're seeing in the education service agreement then, this is specifically related to the progressive students and the team uh, that comes out of the education service agreement uh, that the Grand Area District School Board has uh, with Six Nations. So I've uh, mentioned already uh, last school year, and we've seen a little bit of this already uh, for this current school year, but last year, uh, one of the words that I think really comes to mind is fragmented. And we saw that because of the fact that students were going from in-person to remote and in-person to remote which creates those countless transition periods. And we all know that transition periods, even in a quote, normal, whatever normal years look like, uh, in a normal year, a transition period is difficult to navigate to begin with, uh, let alone having uh, four transitions. And so last school year, previously, students started in person in September. By January, they were remote. By February, they were back to in person. And by April, they were back to remote to uh, finish off that school year. And uh, th that definitely posed uh, some, and I'll use issues as a word here, it posed some issues for many of our students because we knew that as students were engaging in their credit completion, uh, we wanted to ensure as a school staff that we strove to ensure that students were supported and well-being became the priority as students work towards co credit completion. And, and yes, of course, credit com completion is incredibly important as they work towards their Ontario Secondary School Diploma and those 30 credits. But we also know that it's important for students to feel safe, accepted, have that sense of belonging and to be cared for. And especially when we saw those transitions occur so many times last year, that's uh, the priority that took place with the uh, Indigenous Education Team. And just, just a couple of brief stats to be able to um, provide you with. The nominal role at the end of June of 2020, there were 475 students from Six Nations attending Grand Erie. By that September, there were 445. So it dipped 30 students over the summer as they embarked upon that, that new school year. But by the end of June, there were 436 students. So there was only a difference of nine students that were enrolled with Grand Erie District School Board, which of course, there are many different factors at play, but we can definitely see that uh, maintaining enrollment and connections with students was a crucial piece of Grand Area District School Board last year. And then that definitely was a true testament of the uh, Indigenous education team and staff across Grand Area District School Board. And now for the multi-year strategic plan. Robin, do you want to take this slide? So um, just as, as Joanna had mentioned earlier, the launching of the multi-year strategic plan. Um, so as far as Indigenous education, our major goal in the area of belonging was to deepen our system commitment to reconciliation. So I think it's really important to know that it, it, within the, the strategic plan, there's lots of areas where we have been targeting our programming and our, and our efforts within Grand Erie. Um, one of them is professional development. So the, the Indigenous Education Department has been really looking at what is truth and reconciliation and what are the calls to action and getting that information out to schools. And we will continue to do that. 
promoting and participation in reconciliation community engagement activities is one of those goals that we have been working on. Engaging in some authentic learning with Indigenous peoples, communities, and delivering Indigenous courses that allow um, students to see themselves. So these are all a part of our, um, our um, multi-year plan. Now we'll just go on to the next one. So another goal that we have provided in Grand Erie is to de deepen our system commitment to reconciliation through improved education. So these are some of the indicators that we have um, we have identified as some important goals and some outcomes of the planning. And a lot of those, I'll, I'll, you can read those on your own and it would be, I think most specifically increased four and five year graduation rate and increase indigenous resources across the district. I'll go on to the next slide. So this, what you see here is our draft Indigenous education plan. And if, Kevin, if I could just have you go on to the link that's there, because belonging is the major link. You know what, maybe if you go on, it might not come back. The Indigenous education strategic plan that you see in front of you, um, very circular in its efforts with belonging being the major goal um, set forward for our for our district. Around the outside, you see the five indicators of success that I've mentioned, and then the well-being and learning activities that we're planning across the district. So our learning activities are our actions, the actions that the Indigenous education team is actually implementing within the district. And I think we can see just a few of them on the screen, curriculum development, self ID awareness, family workshops, iPad learning, tech support, safer spaces tra and transitions and the rest of it, uh, you'll have difficulty in seeing. Um, but those are all of the activities that the Indigenous education team are planning, um, are providing and our actions with the hope of improving all those indicators of success, increased graduation rates, um, opportunities for staff. So all of those are included in our strategic plan and specifically the Indigenous Education um, Department looks at the goal of belonging as our major goal within the district. And I think it's back to you, Kevin. Okay, thank you very much. And so on the screen right now, this is uh, taken directly from the education service agreement report, you'll see that there were uh, 66 students that had graduated last year. And uh, I was very fortunate and honored to be part of the graduation ceremonies in the fall. Uh, and it was really great to uh, see the enthusiasm and the celebration of students and families. And you'll also see uh, on the screen there listed Ontario scholars, honors with distinction, as well as various graduation awards to honor the students who had worked hard throughout their high school career. Uh, within Grand Area District School Board. And it was uh, mentioned or alluded to, uh, Robin had mentioned many, many different activities and events uh, and supports that were put in place for students. And you'll see on the screen right now, speaking specifically to transition activities. So for students who are making that transition from grade eight uh, into grade nine, into one of the Grand Area District School Board uh, locations. There were initiatives and supports around placements and time timetabling, as well as information videos. And you can see as well, grade eight transition meetings, school information and special programs, as well as information to support parents and self-contained programs. Numerous uh, annual events as well. And just a few of them are listed on the screen right now such as Orange Shirt Day, National Inuit Day, Louis Uriel Day, Tom Longboat Day, National Indigenous Peoples Day, so on and so forth. All opportunities to be able to continue to learn more around Indigenous peoples uh, and as well as the events that take place. And uh, all of these took place across, entire, or across Grand Area District School Board within schools. Community-based education programs. And uh, there are three that are listed on the screen right now. The first one, of course, is our Nations and New Start program, uh, which really helps to provide uh, secondary students who prefer a smaller, more flexible learning environment. Uh, our Section 23 programs, 
to support uh, individuals uh, through academic programming uh, or in uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit youth who are engaged in some capacity with the youth justice program. And finally, the School College Work Initiative Program, uh, amazing opportunities for students to participate in dual college, which allows students to take up to four college credit courses in the trades and or humanities stream, while at the same time taking high school credits. Uh, such a great way to earn not only Ontario Secondary School Diploma, but work towards a college diploma at the same time. And additional initiatives. Robin, did you want to speak to the multilingual Indigenous learners? Sure. Um, some other initiatives that have and are underway are support for the multilingual Indigenous learners, and that's just providing supports. We do have a, a, a department within Grand Erie that is providing supports to our schools, um, looking at some of the English programming and what are they doing to support. They are um, at each of the schools and they are working with some of the teachers to provide supports within the classroom. Some other things that are happening and were launched this, this year, I think early, early into last year were the Indigenous Student Hub. So within our Brightspace location online, there's a specific area that's almost like, I wanna say like a Facebook site where students can go specifically across the district. Um, and there's all kinds of information as to workshops that they may attend, um, information on programs that are offered within the surrounding communities, and just giving students a place to go where they can actually um, share and pro be provided with information. Some of the initiatives that have been happening and are happening are the Learning from the Land initiatives, which... Um, started long before I came on to Grand Erie, but during the school year, um, the development of um, a learning series, a video series that will be launched soon that started, I wanna say over a year ago and um, led by Joe Tyson, Jeannie Martin, and they are going to be sharing that out with the district. So interviews took place from community representatives such as um, Alva Jameson, and Carmen Thomas, and it's, it's going to be launched soon for educators to use. One of the things they're also looking at is a program of choice where um, it will be led by Indigenous people in the teachings that are taking place, and it will be um, researched, and it's just in the development stages right now, but it will be hopefully launched within about a year and a half um, through Hagersville Secondary School, providing learning from the land courses that are specific to um, the Indigenous people in this area. So that's something else that's in the works. And I'll hand it back over to you for the data. Yes, thank you. And I am conscious of time, knowing uh, how much time we do have uh, to share with you tonight. So I just wanted to quickly go through our, our data. And uh, all of this is contained, of course, within the Education Service Agreements uh, report. And so right now you'll see up on the screen uh, the data enrollment by school. Uh, and the top three schools are McKinnon Park, Hagersville, and Brantford. So it gives you a, a display in, uh, of where students from Six Nations attend our secondary schools within Grand Erie. And this next chart, albeit it, it might be small, you'll see the different colors represent different grades. So in grade nine, students are on track if they've acquired eight credits by the end of the year. In grade 10, they're on track if they acquire 16, grade 11, 24, and of course, grade 12, if they've acquired 30. And what you'll see on the screen right now is the credit accumulation. And so by grade nine, it identifies 31% uh, of the students have acquired all of their credits by the end of grade nine. Grade 10, uh, you'll see that number of 29%. Grade 11 dips down to nine and grade 12 at 38%. So as we start to ask those questions, what's going on, what supports are needed uh, to ensure that students are on track and receiving the supports they need, uh, that helps inform us in terms of our next steps. And you've already heard Robin speak to some of the amazing programming and the sports that we have in place. And uh, uh, I think it's important to know what 
truly do those students need in order to be successful? Another way of looking at the data is to say, well, some students may not necessarily graduate in four years, they may take five years. And so therefore, a student that's graduating within five years, when they're in grade nine, they would need to have achieved six credits. In grade 10, that would be 14 credits. Grade 11, it would be 19. In grade 12, it would be 24. And so of course, close to 50% of students are on track to graduate after grade nine, around 40% of the students in grade 10. 43% in grade 11, and then it jumps to 60% in grade 12. And so that just shows students that are on track to graduate in five years. So our present data, and I, I alluded to this right at the beginning, uh, as a result of that fragmented year last year of on and off, on and off, uh, it, it's clear to see that that's very difficult for students to maintain credit accumulation while still staying connected, uh, knowing that well being was uh, important to take into consideration. We've seen already the start of this school year that at the end of quadmester one, 71% uh, of students had achieved all their credits in Six Nations. And I think that's important when we, we bring that into perspective to acknowledge the fact that students this year are achieving. Uh, higher than they were last year, uh, given a little bit more stability and then the increased supports that we've been able to uh, present as a result of the hard work over the Indigenous education team. So the next few sheets, um, just giving you an idea of some of the initiatives that are underway. And I, again, being mindful of time, I'll just um, go through some a few of these quickly. One of the things is we're using data to support student achievement. Um, most excitingly are some of the e-learning opportunities that we're doing within the language program, using iPads within the language program, and using digital resource binders to supplement and provide resource to our language program. And number two, going on to the next page, supporting students. Um, all kinds of different ways. I think with some of the most important things, providing cultural speakers and workshops within the program, creating safer spaces within schools. A lot of this, I think I've already talk about, talked about. Um, presently, Grand Erie mandates that the grade 11 English course across the district, so all grade 11 students, um, the topic is Indigenous perspectives. So that is something that's going on across the district. Um, going on to section three, supporting educators. One of the most important things or one of the things that we're really noticing is a lot of teachers who are um, being subsidized. We do a, we've do we done in September a direct billing with Six Nations Polytech to take their FNMI, First Nations Métis and Inuit studies. So that's one of the things. The development of our professional learning environment. So some exciting things surrounding um, learning from the land initiatives. Our cultural mentors, we're, Kevin and I are going to be interviewing this week for um, two added cultural mentors to the district and some video series again that are coming into the PLE, Professional Learning Environment. Section four, engagement and awareness building. Um, student leadership initiatives are underway. The GPIC, the parent, Grand Erie Parent Involvement Committee, they are looking at Indigenous pedagogy as their means for um, providing resources for the members there. Um, the Safe and Inclusive Schools right now is involved in a book study and they've asked for Indigenous titles. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for teachers to be learning. And most recently, the language engagement, the Nganyakahage Advisory Circle that Claudine and I are both involved in, is um, looking at ways to bring Mohawk speakers to um, the Grand Erie District School Board in coordination with our surrounding communities. So lots of things happening as far as engagement and awareness building and looking forward to the year ahead. And I think, uh, I think a fitting way to close is um, I'm hopeful that you have a Grand Erie District School Board card that came with uh, your documents today and inside that is a, uh, a blurb 
that is expressing our thanks. So on behalf of the Grand Area District School Board and the Indigenous Education Services team, we are pleased to continue our partnership with you. The success of every student within our board is our main goal, and we look forward to future endeavors and experiences with you and the families of Six Nations and our combined efforts to lead the learning within our board to inspire continued growth of all staff and students to the unique Indigenous knowledges, histories, and perspectives of your community will continue to be our goal moving forward. And Donnie Toh, that's it. I think we are opening the floor for any questions about the Education Service Agreement Report. And I think it's time to close the presentation and I guess we are having a question and answer at this time. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, Robin, uh, Joanna, Claudine, uh, for joining us this evening and presenting uh, on this uh, report. Uh, again, opening the floor up for any questions or comments at this time. I see Councillor Wendy has her hand raised. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for the presentation. I was, uh, it was quite well done. I read through it and I thought, uh, compared to previous presentations, this was well laid out. Um, Love the data, the charts, provided a lot of great information. So really appreciate that. Just a couple of quick, uh, what, one's a comment just on your draft piece. I know it's a work in progress. Um, just the use of, of Indigenous because it kind of hops between your First Nations, Métis, Inuit and Indigenous and capitalization. Uh, I know it's draft, so. Um, Two things though, on the cultural competency piece for staff, for um, anyone in the schools, not sure how that's developing and if it's a certified series, because a lot of times there's cultural competence and it's a one hour session here or, or something like that. Is there plans to build that out so that it's actually part of certification with teachers and so on? And then the second question is around the school college work initiative. Are you working with local post-secondary institutes here in the community on that piece, or is it with colleges outside of Six Nations? I can I could probably start if you don't mind. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, with the with the first uh, question that you asked around cultural competency, the series was built in house, um, and so it's it's layered. So we've done some with trustees, we've done some with uh, the principals, and then we will open it up because it's been so difficult, as you know, with supply teachers yeah. being in a virtual setting um, to be able to gather everybody. And so then we'll open it up to all staff, all managers, all educators, DECs, <laughs> EAs. And then what we'll do is uh, once we go through the, the in-house uh, cultural competency series, which brings in more of the local context and more local speakers, then we're going to open it up for the certification of the uh, cultural competency um, that we, I have actually had experience with an offering, and um, that will be another layer. So we don't just want this to be a, a once, you know, a one-time thing where you have a speaker, as you said, and then that's it. We need to make sure that this is embedded in the fabric of everything that we do and that it just doesn't go away after one year initiative. So we kind of have like a, a th three to five year plan is how do we build this out um, and ensure that this is part of the work and not a one-stop shop experience at all. Um, the second piece, I probably will turn to Kevin on school college to work initiative, but I can clearly state that uh, having been part of it right now, we've had some really good experiences, um, both locally, uh, so with local colleges surrounding us, uh, Conestoga, uh, we've, had, we've been working with Laurier, we've been working with Mo uh, Mohawk College, but the interesting piece that has come up is right now, because of the virtual experience, they're asking us to tap into other colleges uh, in a virtual forum to provide more opportunities and courses that students would not be able to uh, get if it was just con uh, contextualized locally. So that has come up a couple of times. So we're willing to expand that when we know that there's a need for a particular course and we can actually go to the, the actual network uh, to see if there's anything that's offered virtually. So through the ebbs and flows of being virtual, uh, there have been some, some interesting opportunities that have come up. And uh, that's where we are right now. I don't know, Kevin, if you want to add to the school college to work part. Yeah, the only thing that I would add to that, so thank you very much, uh, was the fact that I believe the courses that are running right now uh, that I had mentioned were through Conestoga. Uh, but as uh, Joanna had mentioned, there are other opportunities that are presenting itself 
um, as we, <laughs> there are some negatives to being online and uh, being in the midst of the pandemic, but there are some positives that have come out of it. And that's one of them is being able to tap into other sessions and learning uh, throughout the district. And through, so through our regional planning team, I know that there are conversations uh, to take a look at any unused seats and other regional planning teams to see if there are other opportunities for students within our district to take advantage of learning in other areas. Thank you. I was just uh, referring because Six Nations actually has two post-secondary institutes. So I didn't know if you were recognizing those institutes and working in partnership as well. Thanks. And I think just to piggyback of, of we did have a partnership with um, Six Nations Polytech where we did a direct billing for the courses, the FNMI courses that we offered. And it's the first time we have done direct billing. So we made an, made an effort to reach out to them and we um, paid for our employees to go and not have to pay any tuition fees. And they were great to bill us after the course had been finished. So we, we we are starting those initiatives and we will continue to work on those initiatives. I think the other key piece to that, Robin, too, if I can add, is it was it's a barrier sometimes when you have to sign up and pay and fill an application form. So the more that we can remove those barriers and the more we can instill that we really want to impact um, teacher pedagogy and practice, uh, the better it is because that's a professional development that is open to anybody. And we also have a track, not only for existing teachers, but new teachers. So new teachers coming to Grand Erie have the option to, as well, sign up for the additional qualification course, which has been uh, tremendous in terms of the, the, the uptake in, in educators uh, participating in it. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for those responses. I do have another hand raised. Councillor Audrey, you have the floor. Hey, go everybody. Nice to see you again. Uh, I work with the, uh, the, these uh, fine gentlemen and ladies uh, with, on the Native Advisory Committee in Brantford, as well as the Indigenous Education Advisory Committee. So I'm very familiar with the work they're doing and uh, they are to be commended for the work that has been done to try and keep our, our students engaged and to have the success that they have to this point. So my question is, in light of the news released by Minister Lecce, Ontario launches the largest tutoring support program. So because the students were in uh, basically COVID for the last couple of years, learning has been disrupted. So they, he has announced that there's $26.6 billion for the 22-23 school years, the highest investment in public education in Ontario's history. And the couple of the highlights are, 683.9 million for the grants for student needs, which is a 2.7% increase. The average per pupil GSN is $13,059, which is an increase of $339. 90 million for total mental health investments representing 420% increase in funding since 2017-18. 15 million to deliver expanded summer learning opportunities, 92.9 million increase in special education grant funding, and 304 million in time limited additional staffing supports. Uh, just a couple of other things that go along with it are that they've introduced a comprehensive tutoring supports for students throughout the school boards that will also include partnerships with community organizations such as. Uh, which uh, Councillor Johnson just mentioned. So they're looking to do community organizations and partnerships. Supporting student resilience and mental well being, strengthening numeracy and literacy. And the government has also expanded summer learning with $15 million, as well as 10 million for students with special needs and opportunities for summer learning for First Nation students living on the reserve. They have two tutoring opportunities that are digital one-to-one. -one. So in light of this announcement, I'd like to um, basically just drop a seed to find out how this will expand your plans uh, to include um, all of these things for our, our elementary and our Six Nations students who are in attending the Grand Erie schools. And I would be interested in uh, 
uh, having the data as we move along. It's being collected for the elementary and post-secondary, as well as the attendance, as well as the addition to the planning that, that you will be doing with this. So that um, we then should be able to see all of this turn around in next year, the year after, in the success of the students. All of those markers and indicators that you said, we should be able to see the data improve and grow from there. So I'm willing to work with you and we uh, have worked well together so far. So let's continue to do that. And let's get on top of this new in inflection or infusion of uh, funding from the provincial government. Yeah. Well. Thank you, uh, Niall and Audrey uh, for, for your comments. Um, I'll look to, there's a few hands raised, uh, Robin and then Joanna. Robin, you have the floor. So um, just to respond, thank you, Audrey, for sharing all of that information. I think they've, they've gotten funding out to us much sooner than just the announcement because it's funny that you speak to that because just today in meeting with our Indigenous education team, meaning our central team and our Indigenous education services, we talked about the summer learning plans um, for Grand Erie. And I've already connected with um, with um, Judy Rubin and she's willing to work with this work work on this with us and we do have the community based learning center located on third line and our plan is to offer some summer learning for the grade seven and eight students who are entering into high school. Um, we have cultural mentors that have been um, have been employed that we are planning to move forward with providing them as a resource to that center as well as the hiring of an elementary grade seven and eight teacher who can assist with some of the planning it's great sorry grade seven and eight cultural mentor to assist with the planning so we we are looking at that and one of the ideas that miss rubin and i spoke to was offering some two-week programming throughout the summer so students don't have to attend the entire summer but just getting them refreshed and getting them ready for high school, reviewing things that might happen in literacy and numeracy, English and math. Um, so that plan is already in the works. And it's funny that you bring it up because we did just speak to that today. And um, more information will follow and probably our next IAC or NAC meeting that you're attending, Audrey will have probably a more complete concrete plan for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Robin, for, for your response. Yeah, I'll, I'll, go over, yeah. I'll look over to uh, Joanna and just being conscious of the time as well. Uh, Joanna? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so Audrey, uh, the the report that you provided uh, is, is really thorough. In fact, I got the message in the memos on Friday. So as a senior team, uh, I have unpacked the, the uh, information today uh, in senior team with respect to all of those components, in particular, um, uh, the learning recovery plan that is going to be essential uh, for our work. Um, typically, on an average of like a $10 million announcement, the district might get about 170 and it depends on each particular pocket and how we unpack that from a financial component. So we're not there uh, yet because we need to wait for the second stage of the uh, technical paper that comes out with it. Uh, but there'll be uh, a commitment here uh, and moving forward, as I, as I, I stated earlier, to, to look at new ways um, and different ways of, of supporting students in the community. Uh, even our work with, with Travis Anderson to make sure, uh, as Jenny Martin uh, uh, works closely on the transition, what does that look like? But even if we can reach out sooner than just the grade eight to nine transition, that's a key component of our work. Uh, we just can't wait for that one year. And, and so even though we've had some summer learning programs, we're hoping that with the funding that we uh, have been hopefully allotted, that we'll be able to create some more enhanced experiences. Now, there's two things that has, haven't really come up uh, this evening, but the hiring of our principal, Robin, and um, as Robin mentions, cultural mentors, it's more of a focus on graduation coaches and also reaching elementary. So we will continue to do our hiring to ensure that we have the right people in the right spots, but to support the students and um, to create that movement because we've got we've to focus in, in an area 
to see some growth. And then we've got to either scale up or scale down in our work. And so that's what we will intend to do uh, as soon as we unpack the, the funding piece. We also have what we created as an Indigenous Roundtable with many representatives from Six Nations on that, um, on that table. So we will look uh, to you for advice and counsel and suggestions as soon as we get some funding um, to the board and specifically in those uh, envelopes that have been provided uh, as of Friday to us to see what other ways we can, how other, what other ways we can use the funds and be creative to, to reach students and be able to close these gaps. Yeah, well, you hey, thank, you. thank you, Joanna, as well for, for your response. Just really quickly, I just have two quick things that I'd like to mention as well. Uh, one is, you know, looking to how we've increased our supports as well for our high school students across the board. Uh, as we all know, we need to support them in every area in order to achieve their, the, the success at the end to be whatever they choose to be. So, you know, we're, we're trying to work on uh, additional supports as well, you know, especially for, uh, for our high school, but even on reserve and working with is to, you know, as we know, the, the impacts of, of the, the pandemic has had great great impacts on our students and families and so forth. So, you know, as we, as we continue to, to look to those increases in support and further advocate as best as we can for all of our students across the board, I think it's important that we put most, the majority of that focus on exactly those supports and less on, uh, uh, you know, attendance and what that looks like as well. I think that's where we have to uh, really look to achieve the success of our students. The other item that I wanted just to mention is in kind of in relation to Councillor Wendy's comments in relation to the cultural piece of things. I'm wondering if you have had any connection with the uh, survivor secretariat. I think as as we know what's happening with, you know, the you know the search the search of the residential schools, obviously right in Brantford itself, uh, at the Mohawk Institute. I think as we all know, education is the most important piece uh, for us to be able to continue to teach. Uh, you know, uh, Canadians on, on the 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 history and what exactly happened at these institutions. Um, so I'm just wondering if if that's part of your work plan, and if so, uh, you know, if there's been contact uh, with the survivor secretariat uh, to be able to help further educate across the board and within Grand Erie, not just I think with staff uh, of Grand Erie, but I think in addition to students across the board as well uh, that really need to be educated on this topic and what it actually means. Uh, to us uh, here at Six Nations and, and across of indigenous, indigenous people across the country. Robin? So if I could just respond to that, we've been working closely with Dawn Hill and she's actually presented a few times. She's presented at our board table and she's presented to our entire admin team. So we've worked closely with her, we've employed her and she's constantly in communication with us and she's given us information um, as Joanna mentioned for the round table to bring that group together. So we have worked closely with um, that group and we will continue to do so moving forward. That, that's, that's really good to hear, Robin, because I think as we move, you know, closer to, you know, the, the survivors secretary is doing really great work in terms of, you know, the search itself and, and, and prioritizing the areas around the city, you know, they'll, they'll need as much support across the board when they, when they get to certain points of the search and, and what that means. So, you know, I think it'd be great to, to see that support from Grand Erie uh, and, and to be able to, again, further educate, because we know the education is key, as, as you're all well aware of, of educators yourselves. Um, I have Wendy uh, in queue next, and then Joanna, and then I'm going to look to a motion to accept this report as information, uh, and then we'll look to uh, where we go from the next step. So Wendy, you have the floor. Thanks, Clark. And, and thanks for that comment. It just it uh, triggered something. I'm not looking for a response, but you know, we, we talk a lot about truth and reconciliation and the calls to action, but I think we can't lose sight of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Mm -hmm. There's a series of recommendations in those reports, extensive work done, and that really connects to the cultural competency and, and the learning. And, you know, we talk about trauma, we talk about mental health, but it's that well-being as well. So just not to lose sight of that in your in your draft plan. Thanks. Good points, good comments. Thank you for that, Wendy. Uh, Joanna, did you have your hand raised? Sure, uh, just an extension of that. You know, as part of our work, we're not here just for the one-time presentation. We need your support and your guidance too. So um, let, let us know, reach out to us when there is a particular component that we might be missing because we, we have to be working 
um, in, in tandem with you on, on many of these pieces, but we've got to be able to respond to community. And so it's really important for us, and we've made this commitment, that we're not doing this in, 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 you know, in silo, that we're actually reaching out for your advice and for your counsel when these scenarios arise and how we need to respond and what types of support the community needs and what we can do. So uh, I know that the team is very connected and we wouldn't not reach out to ask, but there's some points in time where you have a, a contact or you feel that there's a component in which we need to be really considering and, and, and focusing in on. You need, like our request is that you let us know so that we have your voice as we move forward because we can't do this on our own uh, and we don't wanna be uh, making decisions uh, that don't uh, include the, your voice uh, to support the students and the, and the community. So that is a commitment that I just want to put out there that we even said in, in the Indigenous Roundtable. We can't do this on our own. We have to do this uh, as a team and we have to be here uh, as a united front to support the students and the families. So thank you, uh, Wendelin, again for your suggestions because um, the more we have the opportunity to have these learning conversations, the more uh, we're, we're aware of how we need to plan and what directions that we need to go into, and also what supports and, and resources that you may have that we might not have. Okay, appreciate, appreciate that response. I'll just uh, shift over to Wendy. Uh, subsequent follow-up comment question, I, Wendy? Actually, uh, I thought this was really well done. I really appreciated the presentation and, and the information. I'm happy to make the motion to accept this. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. There is a motion on the floor. It's moved uh, okay. by Wendy. Is there a seconder to that effect? Second, Second Audrey. by Audrey. Thank you for that, Audrey. Further questions and comments? Claudine. Oh, sorry, Claudine. Just want to check in to see if you may be possibly on mute. I'm trying to unmute. Okay. I'm, uh -huh. I'm unmuted now. <laughs> I, I just wanted to let everybody know that we are looking at a new horizon here because we have Joanna as, as our leader and we have the indigenous education team of which there are many. And this is the first time that we have had so many people from Six Nations um, on the Grand Erie team. So things are, are really starting to happen and I think that next year, when we don't have to deal with the pandemic, we hope, I've got my fingers crossed, fingers crossed. that we can really begin to move and work with our children. So I, I just wanted, wanted the council to be aware of that. And um, anytime you want to connect, um, I'm here um, I'm or here. connect I'm with here. any of the other teams. So now go. Okay, thank you so much, Patty. Sorry if I can get Hazel uh, on mute. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, really appreciate your, your comments, uh, Claudine, and obviously all your work over the years. I know it's been, uh, you know, quite extensive in the in the education world. So really appreciate you uh, and Robin and all everybody on the team, really, because it's it's about the at the end of the day, it's about our students and our families. And the important piece, I think, is is the transition. You know, when they leave here from from our our, our schools on the, on the territory to then transitioning to high school, it's always so nerve wracking, right? I mean, I think we've all been there ourselves in terms of you know, that transition piece. So any further supports and anything, any way that we can be as leadership to continue to support you know, our, our students and families will definitely be there and do what we gotta do. So really appreciate all your work uh, and appreciate you uh, joining us this evening and providing the support, this very detailed report, I must say, uh, very well done as well. So the motion is moved by Wendy and seconded by Audrey to accept the, the uh, report as information at this time. Is there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, motion to waive second reading. Moved by Wendy, seconder. Audrey. Second by Audrey. Thank you, ladies. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? 
Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Well, thank you so much uh, to all of those who have joined us this evening on this portion. Uh, Joanna, looking forward to, I know we'll, we'll have to schedule a, a luncheon check-in. I know we usually check in uh, quarterly. It's, it's what it seemed like. <laughs> so looking forward to further check-ins and, and how we could further, uh, again, the further the relationship. Take care, everybody. Stay safe, and we'll talk soon. Have a great evening. Oh, no. Okay, Council, that leads us into our next delegation. And just a FYI, we do have two more delegations uh, left on our agenda. So I just want to just be conscious of the time. Uh, and we'll give 15 minutes each at this time uh, to each of the delegations and, and further to Q&As. Uh, the next uh, delegation we have is a seed presentation. I just want to confirm, uh, is there who will be speaking on, the, on behalf of seed? Myself. Rebecca. Uh, I'll start. Okay, perfect. Good, e yeah. Good evening, Rebecca. You have the Hi. floor. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Oh. Um, with me sorry, from the... Really quick, sorry, really, sorry to interrupt you, Rebecca. Wendy, did you have your hand raised? I did. I just, if there's any decision on this, I have to declare a conflict. So I just wanted to be upfront with that. Okay, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Thank you, Wendy. Back over to you. Apologies, Rebecca. Okay. Um, this is, uh, we're here to present like the annual sort of report to council. The SEED committee is, um, is a committee that was established um, when Six Nations of the Grand River um, entered into an agreement with Imperial Oil. And that was back in 2002. It's hard to believe that it was 20 years ago, um, but it was. Um, so at that time, once the agreement was signed, a steering committee was established. And there's, there are funds that flow to Six Nations out of that agreement. So over the years, um, there has been a number of educational employment initiatives that have been funded out of that. So about five, almost $6 million over the past 20 years has come into the community for, as a result of this, of this agreement. Um, the goals, if we can have a look at that, I was gonna, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, I'll just go ahead. Uh, Mike, if you can go to the next one. The seed committee goals um, as outlined in the agreement are to utilize the funding to achieve the objectives of the agreement to evaluate the outcomes and to continue the collaboration between Imperial and the Six Nations community. We'll go to the next one. The governance or the committee members um, are shown here on this slide. Um, Jeannie Martin, who was in the previous delegation is also part of this. And, and in terms of Six Nations, we have Anne Noyce with us tonight. And if you could turn on your, turn on your camera and say hi. Maybe she's not still with us. <laughs> we have Peggy, uh, Peggy as well, Clavo from Great. She's with us. Um, and, and Jeannie, of course, Jeannie Martin from the Grand Area District School Board. And with Imperial um, helping me to present, and Mike will be taking over in a little bit. Mike Ciccone is the lead from, in, um, from Imperial Oil uh, with the committee. And we have uh, Michelle Camilleri with us tonight, Jessica Duell. And uh, Carly Jackson couldn't be with us, but she's um, also part of the committee. So it's a small committee and we meet um, I know quite frequently to look at you know, what, what we can do with the funding and we're gonna report on all of the things that have been happening with that funding. If we go to this last, uh, the next annual budget one, um, last year there was a little over $300,000 that were received as a result of the agreement. Um, we started out back in 2002 with a quarter of a million dollars annually. And the agreement was amended back in 2016 with the, and we added the CPI supplement annually. So all funds that come in are directed to programs with a small allocation to local community advertising. And I'm gonna ask Mike to take over from here to report on the actual kinds of things that have been funded and all, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So Mike, over to you, please. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be able to share some of the highlights from the 2021 SEED uh, supported programs. Of course, there are more details available in the summary report that was submitted to council. And uh, as Rebecca went through, we do also have committee representatives for these programs that are available to answer any questions that you, that you might have. So I'm gonna to start tonight with the, the elementary schools. Uh, There's almost $30,000 allocated to the elementary schools last year. A couple of highlights from that are the, the Mad Science Summer Virtual Day Camps that were run um, 
unfortunately virtual for the second consecutive year. But the uh, the upside of that is that we were able to have up to 100 students join in person, um, or sorry, virtually versus the in-person allocation of, of 50 students in the past. And so supplies were delivered directly to students for their guided use during the interactive programs. And there's a variety of STEM-based activities like chemistry experiments, art, and the science of flight that were offered. And we had 96 students participate uh, through the summer months this year. Virtual learnings replaced as well the in-person science fairs and, uh, and were focused primarily on the outdoor education activities to learn more about traditional ways. Funding was used to support elements such as virtual lessons, animal track books, bird watching, and elder speakers that were incorporated into the science objectives of their daily learning. We were also able to support teacher professional development. 15 Six Nations teachers and teaching assistants were able to complete a variety of their AQs in special education, math, computers and technology, learning disabilities, autism, environmental education, and outdoor learning programs with SEED support. And you can see um, some photos of the, uh, of the programs on the, the right-hand side of the page. As we move into secondary education, the support for last year was nearly $40,000. The homework support program was offered, again, uh, participation was impacted by the pandemic down to about 160 students in total versus uh, 420 students in 2019, but um, continued to offer that program and mainly secondary students participated seeking support in math, literacy, research and written essays and reporting. Online training and guidance was available for students and parents, along with one-on-one -on -one tutoring to ensure the learning needs were being addressed. The STAY Awards uh, were also offered that recognized the hard work and commitment of Six Nations students in grades seven through 12, who have achieved top marks in science and math. And for 2021, we also added honorable mention awards that were given to students who had applied for the STAY Awards with an average grade of over 75%. So in total, we had 26 students that received a certificate of recognition, as well as a monetary award between 75 and $200. So you see on the bottom of the slide photos of a couple of this year's recipients. And all of the 2020-2021 STAY Award winners will be recognized in this week's editions of the Turtle Island News and Two Row Times. Moving on to post-secondary, sorry, post-secondary. Um, there's almost $30,000 allocated uh, this past year. Um, as students transi transition to, uh, to this phase, the support continues. And this year, 26 graduates were recognized for their achievements in local community newspapers. And you can see a sample of that on the top right-hand part of the screen. And also three seed scholarships were granted to students enrolled in business administration, human resources for $2,500, agricultural studies for $1,500, and I might mess up the pronunciation on this, my apologies, the Ogweho languages for $500. And finally, sponsorship of five students who were enrolled in engineering, biotechnology, biology, and mechanical technician programs were provided support for tuition and books. We move to the Six Nations Polytechnic support that was $150,000 allocated from SEED to support a variety of programs. The STEAM Academy redesigned secondary level math and physics courses to be taught from an indigenous worldview with relevant context and applications. And the Polytechnic STEAM Academy offered 48 courses in the fall of 2021. And there was extensive redesign required to complete two of these courses so far with plans to continue uh, with more. For the robotics program, funds were used to purchase equipment for the courses, as well as the, comp as well as the competitions. And uh, teacher professional development was supported to deliver courses from an Indigenous perspective, 
and also provided for tuition reimbursement for successful, com successful completion of those courses. Trade students that were in work placements received wraparound supports while in the program, including tools, transportation, and peer mentoring. And funding also supported pathways development in the arts and technology trades uh, with equipment for music and construction, as well as funding student participation in the outside looking in theater program. And finally, supporting the employment and development um, with an allocation of $60,000 for GREAT. Funds were provided to various training initiatives that the, the GREAT uh, staff and in collaboration with OSTTC to offset training expenses in areas such as welding, the, the right or the work ready indigenous trades experience program, joint apprenticeship training initiative and safety and union training. Apprenticeship awards and scholarships also help students with covering expenses related to ongoing training and tuition costs, as well as the costs of living expenses for them and their families while they're in those programs. I also want to highlight that GREAT has developed a series of videos to show off the success stories and encourage interested Six Nations members to enter the skilled trades. And on the bottom of the screen here, we won't watch the videos, but there are some uh, of them to, to follow up on at your convenience and many more of them available on GREAT's YouTube channel. So that's the highlights on the, the programs for this year. And again, most of that, more of those details are available in the, uh, in the summary report. The last item I just wanted to, to bring up um, is around the, the agreement status. So the seed agreement, as you'd heard, has been in place for, for 20 years and contributed to nearly $6 million supporting the education, training and employment for Six Nations community. With the upcoming expiry at the end of this year, the seed committee is supportive of continuing to build on the select, successful collaborative relationship between Imperial and the Six Nations community to find ways to improve the agreement and grow the relationship. We look forward to working together with the support of the seed committee members and council through this year to, to do that. And with that, um, that's all we had for content to present. So I guess we can open up for questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rebecca and Mike, for, for providing and walking us through uh, the presentation. Uh, I'll look now to questions and comments, uh, and also just want to acknowledge uh, prior to the presentation, uh, Councillor Wendy declared her conflict and any decisions made as well as Councillor Michelle in the chat as all, uh, uh, also as well declared conflict. Uh, I'll look to questions, comments. I see Councillor Nathan has his hand raised, and I'll go over to Councillor Helen. Nathan, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks, Chief, and, and thanks for the presentation, Mike, uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the program and, and the benefits um, and, and really the, the, the work that's going on to, to support um, Indigenous students in that frame. Um, the one question I did have, I saw a bit of it in the summary report and I saw a bit of it in the presentation, but no direct correlation. I'm just wondering about uh, any students or any advancements in the programming uh, particularly around post-secondary on uh, environmental science and and if there's any um, work going on or, or anything uh, to kind of illuminate on on that front um, I, I just seen I seen references but I didn't see a direct correlation or any bullets to any initiatives that are going on to support uh, students going into indigenous science or sorry environmental sciences Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start to answer that question and any of the other members can, uh, can add to it. Um, I, I don't think that there's anything specific that we're doing uh, in, in that area. I think that the things like the seed scholarships uh, are open for, for applications and the criteria is, is focused on science and technology. And so something like environmental would be something that would be um, uh, open for those for those applications. I would say that we we receive a variety of, of uh, applications.
applications from from different programs and a, and a wide range. I think as you've seen, there were scholarships uh, awarded for for languages included in that. So um, I, I think you raise you raise a good point: is what are we doing to to promote those uh, types of activities? I think that's one of the areas that that we can improve through uh, through outreach. Okay, thanks. And and with that, Chief, I'll um, accept uh, to move uh, to accept this as information. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Nathan. There's a motion on the floor. I moved by Nathan to accept. Is there a seconder? Second by Sherry Lynn. Further questions and comments over to you, Helen. Sorry, Helen, you're uh, you're getting it off of mute. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for the presentation. Uh, the program has come a long way since it first started. I remember when SEED first started and I was working with that. Um, so, and I'm really glad to see that they're really concentrating on the trades because we really need to uh, get our people into the trades. One of the things I've identified in working with the housing um, is that we're running a low, really low on construction people to build houses and stuff like that because all of the construction people are starting to retire. So, and the younger people aren't always uh, going into that kind of a, a trade. So we really need to concentrate on that. And I guess if the agreement is up in December, we as a council have to sit down and go through that agreement. Um, remember this is made what, 20 years ago <laughs> or more? You know, costs go up and stuff like that. <laughs> so we need to sit down and look at that, have a really good discussion and uh, on that agreement before December. I agree. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Helen, for your comments and totally agree with uh, your last comments in relation to uh, the uh, ex expiration uh, date on the agreement this of this year. So just really quickly, if we can touch on that in the past, what was the process uh, usually in terms of I know it's negotiated for the for the next uh, seven years. Um, so what in, in the past has been the process in terms of, um, you know, renegotiating or looking at that agreement for potential uh, increases or, you know, to Helen's points as well um, of how we can further, uh, you know, look to increases of that agreement. Well, I know in the past, um, council has struck a committee to, to do that. Um, and I don't know what this council, how you want to approach it, but it's a, it's not too long of an agreement, but, um, but nevertheless, it needs to have careful review and, you know, and look, to, look at ways to improve it. For both parties, I know that uh, Mike has mentioned that as well. So, and so council would do their sort of review first and then have a joint meeting maybe. So, and the committee can make recommendations if you wish. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that, Rebecca. I, I think that's something that we need to get uh, uh, on the table quite uh, quite soon, uh, given mm -hmm. December 31 seems to, as we know, time flies yeah. uh, and we want to be as, as prepared as possible. So. Uh, we can, I, I don't think we necessarily have to make that decision at this point. I've made note of it as well on, on mine. So uh, we could at least look to the accepting of this report uh, and then we'll get into the next steps in terms of uh, what that potentially could look like uh, for this council as well. So appreciate that. Thank you, Rebecca. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, then it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Just a reminder as well, Councillor Wendy's, Wendy Johnson and Michelle Bomber have declared conflict. Motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by uh, Nathan, second by Sherry Lynn. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Well, thank you, Nyawa, so much uh, to each of you for joining us uh, this evening uh, and walking us through your presentation on SEED. Uh, definitely uh, grateful for the, uh, you know, the opportunity and the partnership for, for our community on this. As you've uh, noted, all the highlights that this program has brought to our community has been very, uh, very instrumental. So we just want to say thank you, Nyawa, for that. Uh, just one of the pieces that I that I did highlight as well since the inception of this program, the 20 years. I mean, six million dollars is 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 quite quite an imprint, an impact to community, and so really uh, can appreciate 
uh, all of the partnership and work on this um, on this sector in this program. So again, thank you for joining us this evening uh, and looking forward to how we can best uh, continue moving forward uh, in this partnership. So thank you, stay safe and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay, council, we're, we're moving along here on our agenda. Our, our final delegation on our agenda is uh, the Brand Community Healthcare System delegation in terms of a letter of support, which is on your agendas as well, uh, as well as the, the discussion or rather um, inform, informing us on the Indigenous Medicine Services. So I've, I've had the opportunity to both meet with uh, Mr. McNeil as well as Mr. Emerson. Uh, last week, Tammy and I had the opportunity to sit down and we thought this would be a, gr a great opportunity to come in front of council and community and to provide an update in terms of uh, you know, next steps and what's happening in, at, uh, with the Bradford General Hospital. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I'll um, pass it right over to, I believe it is it Paul or David who will be speaking first uh, and then we'll look to any Q and A's at the end of your presentation. Maybe I'll just go first, David, for a second. And so um, thank you, Chief Hill and members of council and others. Um, thank you for having, including us in on this meeting. It's greatly appreciated. And as your chief said, we did have, I, I felt a very good discussion last week and, and thank you for the invitation to come here tonight. My name's Paul Emerson. I'm the chair of the board of directors of the Brant Community Healthcare System. And doing most of this presentation will be actually Dr. David McNeil, who is our chief executive officer and president. I also wanted to acknowledge that Teresa Doolittle is a representative on our board and um, I, I, that's formally, I guess maybe formally, she's represents Six Nations on our board, but she certainly is a Six Nation resident and, and sits on the board of directors and does an excellent job, I should say. Um, we collectively, this part of Ontario, this region desperately needs a new hospital. The Brantford General Hospital has some good parts. Um, we're getting a new emergency department. Our pediatric unit has been well recognized. The D-wing doing some day surgeries and other procedures so it's, a, it's still fairly modern, but the remainder of the hospital is way past its best before date. We've been, um, we've put together plans and been lobbying the provincial government through the Ministry of Health. They, at the staff level, agree it's time to move on, but we've sort of got stalled here. And um, we're now launching a, a stronger advocacy campaign, hoping that we can get some traction, particularly with the provincial election coming up. So I'm going to turn this over to you, David, and maybe you can give the background. And thank you again. Thanks, Paul. And um, maybe what I'll do is I will share my screen and um, can everybody see that? Quickly go through um, um, our presentation and talk about some of the highlights. Um, Paul, I think, has really hit the, the main points um, of why we're here. So I'll just fill in some of the details. In 2019, the Brand Community Healthcare System started its strategic plan. Um, we had a steering committee comprised of 33 people that represented our broader community as well as internal uh, stakeholders. Um, Laurie Davis Hill, actually from Six Nations, sat on that uh, steering committee. Uh, we came up with the vision, a mission, and uh, some key values for the organization. Um, you know, the vision was exceptional care, exceptional people. Um, um, we we recognize we can't get exceptional care without exceptional people, so we are working on that vision. Our mission was working together to build a healthier community and we recognized as a hospital um, that we're not an island, but we need to work with our community. Uh, we need to work with partner organizations uh, to actually achieve that um, mission. Um, and a lot of that work is being done through our Ontario Health Team. And then of course our values around compassion, equity, re um, respect and accountability are, are key to our organization. Um, and you know they represent the, few, the letters of care um, so, you know, we need to care for our community. We identified five key goals. Well, one of those key goals uh, was around championing health um, equity. And one of the details around that goal was to um, strengthen the cultural safety of the brand community healthcare system uh, for Indigenous people. Um, and new, in that work, um, 
you know, we've done um, a few things that I'll just highlight uh, later on in the presentation. Um, of course, we've also been struggling as, as we all have with managing the pandemic. Um, we've had to do a lot of things within our organization, really pivot our operations in the last um, couple of years. Um, very similar, I know, because Ashley Taylor sits on our, our um, community uh, emergency operations center, um, setting up a testing centers, expanding our capacity, dealing with supplies and equipment, of course, as well, dealing with new infection control measures and, and practices, and really having to expand significantly the capacity of the Brant Community Healthcare System uh, to manage the, the pandemic itself. So those are some of the, you know, the overall issues and things that we've been dealing with. I'm gonna speak a little bit more specifically to you know, the capital planning that's um, going on at the organization because that's really the focus of our conversation today. Um, the Ministry of Health has a five-stage capital planning process. Um, and there's a couple of phases uh, where it requires government approval. First, in the development of the um, redevelopment of the hospital in 2020, in February 2020, we submitted to government um, a what, what's called a pre-capital submission. This is work that the hospital can do. And it's really asking the government that, hey, we've done some preliminary work and we need to plan a new hospital. That was overseen by what we call a master planning steering committee. Um, um, and it was made up of community representatives, the mayors, um, the chiefs of both councils, um, our MP, our MPP, um, as well as um, patient representatives and some community leaders. Uh, Chief Mark Hill had the opportunity um, to sit on that committee. For the overall hospital redevelopment, we, we've submitted, uh, as Paul said, this to government, supported by the bureaucracy, but we don't have political support for this yet. So we are in the process of trying to get that political support. It's been almost two years since we've been trying to get that. So we need approval to move from the pre-capital phase to stage one for the redevelopment of the hospital. On a more positive sense, in the, um, for the emergency department, we're actually in stage four where we're doing our detailed uh, working drawings and those will be submitted to government by April and we'll just then wait for approval to move forward with uh, tendering that. So that gives you a bit of an highlight of some of the, uh, of the planning process. Um, you know, at the Willett site, it's been expanded. We now have 52 beds at the Willett site. Um, it's seeing over 20,000 uh, visits uh, each year at its urgent care center. We've made significant uh, investments in the capital infrastructure at the Willett site of over $7 million over the last few years. Maybe just to talk a little bit about our emergency department. Emergency department is broken up, uh, project is broken up into two different phases. Uh, everything in gray here that you see on the slide is our existing emergency department, their ambulance drop-off zone and our existing emergency department. In project one, everything in color represents new construction for our emergency department. We're breaking this up into two different projects. We'll expand significantly clinical space around the emergency, existing emergency department, as well creating some support space. And one of the key areas of support uh, will be um, a large indigenous space uh, right in the front of the hospital um, as, you're, as you're coming in through the main entrance to support um, um, in, uh, the indigenous population that is using the Brant Community Healthcare System. As you're probably aware, um, we did establish uh, an indigenous space on the eighth floor of the hospital um, a few years ago. Um, that's been well utilized um, as for people who can get into the hospital these days. Um, and it's been uh, had good feedback on that. In addition, as Paul mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we've created um, what we call an Indigenous Medicine Service. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get near the end of the presentation. In the second phase of the emergency department redevelopment, we get into redeveloping the old emergency department and do that. Uh, piece by piece. At the end of the day, what we'll have is a large, modern, new emergency department for the Brant Community Healthcare System. Given that we're short on time, and I know that your agenda is packed, I thought I would just move now to the overall hospital redevelopment. I'm just going to orient you to the this what you're looking at here. This is a very just a schematic piece. This is St. Paul Avenue, um, and this would be um, the Terrace Hill Street. Uh, we have a number of buildings on sites. You can see here that um, the buildings that will be retained on site are the old B-Wing, 
Um, it won't be able to be used for patient care purposes. It just doesn't meet the standards. We'll use it for things like office and education space. The C building and the D building, which was the most recent development, we were moving a number of buildings on site, the E building, which was the old nursing residence, uh, plus an H building over here, which was, which is a hospital that currently houses my office, um, but it will all be uh, removed. The plan is to build a large new building um, uh, adjacent to the, um, the existing hospital connected to it um, and connected to the renovations that I just showed you within the emergency department. At the end of the day, um, we'll have a new modern uh, hospital um, if we can get approval um, to plan and, and move it forward. We're in the process right now, of really, you know, trying to work with our community to get our community voice uh, behind it. Um, our MPs made it clear, MPPs made it clear, sorry, that uh, that community voice is extremely important as we're looking to the redevelopment of the hospital. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, finally, just a little bit about the in Indigenous Medicine Service. Um, I stopped sharing my screen so I can see everybody about it, but, you know, this is a service that, um, you know, when Laurie Davis Hill was doing the work on our strategic planning committee, she said one of the things that we really need was an Indigenous navigator. We have actually have an Indigenous navigator now. Uh, but the really important piece about how our Indigenous navigator, Lisa, uh, works is that she's working in partnership with uh, Dr. Um, Amy Montour and Dr. Karen Hill. And Dr. Montour and Dr. Hill have really been the champions of our new Indigenous medicine service. Um, at the Brant Community Healthcare System. I don't know if people had the opportunity to read the article within the Hamilton Spectator that came out this weekend. If you haven't had that opportunity, I'll make sure that you get an opportunity to read that. Uh, but Dr. Montour and Dr. Hill will uh, accept referrals um, through the Indigenous Medicine Service at the Brant Community Healthcare System uh, for patients, either directly from families um, or the patients at the patient's request or through um, other uh, practitioners within the organization um, so that they can provide that um, Indigenous focus um, in terms of the health service uh, services delivery. You know, this is really um, leadership for those two physicians and Lee who've really taken this uh, forward. Um, we've really just stepped out of their, their way and provided the resources to, to make it happen. And I think it's a good example and direction of where we can um, head as an organization as we look at increasing and improving uh, care for the Indigenous population we serve at the Brant Community Healthcare System. So really the request that we have for Council, um, happy to answer any questions, is that um, Council would consider a motion um, to support um, the right the lighting of a letter um, to um, the Ministry, the Minister, the Premier, and whoever you think is most appropriate for to write that letter to really just indicating your support for um, our need for a new hospital um, uh, at the Brant Community Healthcare System to serve you know, all of our communities that, um, that are served at the Brant Community Healthcare System. So with that, Paul, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but I would be happy to answer any questions. No, David, that's fine. Thank you, and we'll answer questions. Thanks, Chief. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, David and Paul, for, for joining us this evening. Again, just to before I go to any questions, uh, I know, again, you know, we've, we had a really good meeting last week, and I'm glad to see and hear Dr. Karen Hill and Dr. Amy Mentor uh, are really, the, you know, the leading of the Indigenous Medicine Service. And I know we even touched on the Indigenous space uh, that's currently at, uh, you know, at the, at the Brantford General Hospital. Uh, the, the, the other thing that I just wanted to touch on in relation to, you know, how we can better serve is, you know, the, within the health system itself and systemic racism. I know we touched a little bit on, had a conversation on how we can, you know, further improve on, on those uh, services for our people as well. As we know, it's always difficult and, and quite emotional and scary in a sense for some to even go to a hospital, right? So to make it as comfortable uh, and to have that compassion and care uh, as far as it can go for, you know, the patients across the board, I think is, is number one, especially from our community. Um, and so, you know, really looking, uh, having those conversations and going to look to continue to have those, uh, you know, the, the true partnership and, and what we can do when we actually work collaboratively together. So really appreciate David and Paul uh, for meeting uh, with Tammy and I last week and how we can, again, further, further our, our support and relationship as we, as we maneuver and move forward. 
so again, the, the request is there. It's within, uh, I know there's been other municipalities also, to my knowledge, it's kind of been stalled at the political level of things. And so this will help ultimately kind of push into getting into phase one um, of the overall plan or stage one rather. Um, so that's, that's what the notes that I have taken uh, from our last meeting. So there is a, a motion, uh, a letter of request on your agendas, uh, but we will look to questions uh, at this point and, and perhaps I'll look to entertain uh, that motion as well. I see uh, Wendy has her hand raised, so I'll, I'll pass the floor over to yourself, Wendy. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thank you, Dr. McNeil, for the presentation and, and Mr. Emerson. As many of my colleagues know, I've had uh, a lot of loss in my family over the past couple of years, and, and many of them have been at BGH. Um, they've gone through the system. And I think, Mark, your, your comments about systemic racism, I mean, I think there's no argument there. The healthcare system is one of those sectors that has a lot of work to do. And I think it's for that reason that we have to support the investment in BGH because there are changes, there are positive changes happening. Uh, my sister, she's been at BGH for four months. She's still there. She's gone through life support. I think she's been on every ward. She's done a lot of things and there's been up and downs. And I had the opportunity to actually work with the hospital and have a conversation with Dr. Manil about what our expectations were and, and what some of those needs were. And the door was open for that communication to do that hard work, to do those improvements. And I think that says a lot. Certainly for me, it does. So I think um, I wholeheartedly support that. I think we need to do more than just write a letter. I think we need to advocate as well because this is a hub for us for emergency services, for hospitalization. And we need that investment. We need a modern facility where our people can go and get the services and the treatment that they deserve. And through that process, I think, do those other improvements around cultural competencies and those learnings and, and that going forward. I mean, it's all about communication. It's all about team. And, and I've had these discussions too. I mean, we need three more leads, right? In order to meet the needs of community, because you're absolutely right. It's that contact. If a community member has a loved one that's in emergency in the hospital, they want to talk to somebody. They just want to have that communication. You know, but, you know, the people like Lee, the people like Dr. Karen Hill, they're just amazing people and they're doing that, but they're spread so thin. And just my last sto story that I'll share. So my sister has been there for almost four months and she's not seen her grandbabies for that time. Mm -hmm. And through Lee, through that advocacy, they're allowing her two grandbabies to come into the indigenous room so that she can spend a little bit of time with them. And that's enormous for the mental health, for the healing, for the well-being. So it's for that reason that I'm, I'm happy to make that motion. Thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Wendy, for, share, for sharing those. I do have a motion on the floor uh, to move on the recommendation as laid out on your agendas. Is there a seconder to that effect? I'll second it, Mark. Audrey. Thank you for that, Audrey. It's been seconded. I'll also shift it back over to yourself, Audrey, for any further questions or comments. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. I've I met with you before, Dr. McNeil. We've had several conversations and the biggest concerns that I have at that time are the, uh, the super bugs, uh, the staff infections and all the uh, diseases like that. Like, there's such a high rate of infections among uh, people of six nations. So, and also the, to my understanding, there are higher infection rates in, the, in this certain hospital. So I welcome and totally support a new Brantford General Hospital because it's not only for you, it's for us, because we are the clients who will be coming there to, to use your services. And I think that our cultural ceremonies that can be done in a hospital need the place for dignity, privacy, and to be able to have that uh, sense and that feeling and that spiritual, I guess, fulfillment there. So I do appreciate it. And so I do second the motion. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, Audrey. And just to, just to further add to a quick story as well, I know, and to David, this leads back to Wendy's comments of just communication and really the relationship. I know you have helped, uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the advocacy for families during COVID as well. As we all know, it's been such a tough time across the board. And, 
you know, that that has been and truly uh, still grateful to those families that you've assisted to, you know, to be with their loved ones as as they're go as they're passing on and so forth. So just want to also, you know, just really say thank you. I know I, you I can text you or pick, you know, pick up the phone and be able to to get a response and back. So really appreciate that communication. I know you've helped a number of families over over the COVID times and also just to want to extend across the board to all of our frontline healthcare workers. You know, the things that they have been through over this, these past two years, you know, both here, Six Nations, across the board, really, in this province and in this country, you know, they, 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 they deserve the warmest gratitude, uh, you know, on behalf of Six Nations, uh, just for all that they've, do, they've done in this pandemic to continue to help to keep us all safe. So really want to extend that as well, if you can, to as many as your frontline workers at the Bradford General Hospital. So thank you so much. Uh, is there any further questions or comments in relation to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none then, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second read. Moved by Wendy, seconder? Audrey. Seconded by Audrey, all in favor? Favor. Any, any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Well, again, thank you, uh, David and Paul, for joining us this evening. I'll work with uh, Tammy to get you the uh, the letter of support that was just passed, the motion, but also uh, in further follow up to Wendy's comments in terms of additional mm -hmm. advocacy. I think that we can uh, we can also sit down. I know we we have another meeting that we'd like to also discuss other items. So maybe we can add that to that meeting in terms of how we could further support some additional advocacy on our behalf to, to see this hospital built in, in a timely manner. And that government knows that, you know, we, we need this across the board for all our communities. So really just want to say now and appreciate this yeah, presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I guess when we just even continuing to work together on improving our service is, is really key to yeah. the board. And um, I know to the senior team, so thank you for um, all of the comments and support, Mark and, uh, and council. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Please take care and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Have a great evening. Okay, Council, that leads us into uh, just getting back to our agendas. I'm going to continue to go down uh, the list and, and what we have to finish. So that was done our delegation portion. I'll now move to the adoption of the General Council minutes of February 8th. Is there a mover, seconder? I'll move, Moved sure. by Helen, seconded by Sherry Lynn. Are there any questions, comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Sorry, just really quickly, want to check in with you, Audrey. I'm not sure if your hand's still up from the last time or if you have a question or comment. Okay, she should be okay. <laughs> uh, okay I'm going to keep moving right along here in our agenda council. I'll move to the recommendations from the BNI committee, recommendation 6A. Looking to the mover and seconder, Hazel and Audrey. I second it. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Just uh, if I can, I know Hazel uh, did email me. She was having some connectivity issues. Hazel, just want to check in. Are you able to hear us okay? Okay, I, I just, uh, I want to get another mover then just to make sure. Is there a mover to replace Hazel as she I, I can is move it, Mark, since I was at the meeting. Okay, thank, okay, thank you, Audrey. Is there a seconder? Second by Helen. Thank you, Helen. So it's been moved and seconded. The resolution is there. Further questions, comments? I believe our director of public works is on the line line as well for any additional questions or comments. There he is. Good evening, Mike. Hey, Chief. Hey, Council. Community. 
Okay, seeing or uh, seeing no questions or comments at at this time, I'll go I'll go to the vote. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, recommendation six B. I will have second reading. Oh, sorry, uh, Audrey, that's six D. So six B, we're going to do mm -hmm. second reading all at the end. Okay, I move. That the Building and Infrastructure Committee recommends to the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council to approve the following. Whereas the Six Nations Public Works Department has identified a missing section of sidewalk on Fourth Line connecting to a, a housing uh, development on Herald Road as a community safety hazard. Therefore, that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approves to award the Fourth Line Sidewalk Project to Hills Site Service Inc. in the amount of uh, two hundred seventy-nine thousand four hundred fifty-two dollars. Once the source of funds identified as a family well-being funding from the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services, I so move. Perfect. Thank you for that, Audrey. And I just do. Uh, Hazel is engaged on the chat, and she has confirmed that she is still seconding. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay. Seeing or hearing none, then all in favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, recommendation 6C. I move that the Infrastructure Committee uh, recommends the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council to approve the following, that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council supports that a proposal be submitted for upgrading streetlights in Ishwigan in 2022 to 23, intake of the Indigenous Transportation Initiatives Fund. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, Audrey, seconder? Seconded by Michelle, thank you for that. Questions, comments? Wendy. So uh, I understand that this is limited funding. It's only at 75,000, right? Um, and I don't, uh, I don't recall how open it was to what we could apply for. I understand that street lights are important, but when I think of the condition of our roads, um, like just there, are, all the roads seem to be bad, but there are certain sections that are just horrible and there are safety hazards right now. So I don't know if there's anything that can be done to do assessment or anything like that to help us get the roads fixed and money could be used for that. Because when I think of priorities, I mean, if the lights are working, that's great. So move to the next priority. Because when I read the briefing note and it says incorporate aesthetic elements for standalone light poles, that's not a priority in, in my mind, looking at everything that we need here in the community in that section. But if we're um, restricted by the components of the submission, then I understand that, but is this the top priority? I guess I just need clarification on that because, you know, the total cost is 140. So this is half of that anyway, or do we reduce the aesthetic elements and bring down that additional cost of this is the way we go. So just a couple of questions there. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Wendy. I'll, I'll shift over to, to Michael. Yeah, thanks for the questions. All great questions. Um, we are actually going to have presented a road management plan. So it's going to take into account the next 10 years uh, in March to BNI and likely it will come on to council. So I think that's the that's the plan uh, that everyone's waiting to see as far as needs and how we, how we can strategically address our infrastructure gap. Because um, I, I think everybody can agree we're seeing the the impacts of the freeze thaw cycle on our roads right now a lot of the road road sections are are in quite terrible condition um one of one of them being uh the one Wendelin's road definitely uh, I, uh the roads foreman does does provide that update to me and i i make it a point to drive down them and definitely agree there's a lot of sections that need work but uh, under this funding specifically uh, it was for some different things roads not necessarily planning not necessarily but uh, street lights were included as well as economic development, development. Um, i was able to discuss with the ecdev corp to see how it met their priorities and they they respectfully you know declined 
um, to, to submit to this. So this is, this. while I definitely agree, we can back up the aesthetic elements to, to reduce the cost, because this is only a portion of the cost. Um, we're we're going to do that, but this is the best project that we had that would fit the bill for this particular fund. But, you know, quite well taken as far as uh, roads and infrastructure, we're going to be looking at all funding opportunities to help address um, the infrastructure gap here. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for that, Mike. And just just further to add, I know, uh, you know, obviously we've we've all been getting calls. It's it's pothole season. I think this is in fact probably the worst I've ever seen it. Um, but just in in relation to um, you know the the big trucks that travel our roads, as we all know, you know the there's a certain weight limit, and I think that's the other piece to these to the problems that. Uh, we have on our roads is, you know, should we look to more the enforcement piece of that that weight limit uh, in, in these big trucks that travel our roads? As we all know, they're not meant for those. Uh, just wondering, maybe, Mike, if you could touch on that, because I, that was one of it. And thank you to Councillor Michelle for, for raising this to just a reminder to community that, you know, we are in with the heavy rainfall that we've been receiving, the melting snow, you know, the, the high river, the flooding season. The pothole season, you know, we're we're asking to please, uh, you know, take as much as best care as you can, uh, as we, you know, try to as as the road crew, and that I think that's the other thing that we have to also commend our our guys on and ladies on the roads. You know, I don't think they get out as much as yes, the roads are in in dire need of repairment. They're also doing the best they can with the capacity that we have. So I also want to commend uh, our roads crew. Uh, on on the work that they do because it's not easy. Uh, you know, we get. I, I think I've I've sent over maybe five, five potholes in direct areas to public works in the last you know couple of days. So uh, that's much like many other councillors as well who are also receiving these complaints. So maybe uh, Mike, if you could just touch a little bit on that, uh, that in terms of helping community understand more on those pieces. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. I appreciate the shout out to the roads crew. They they went from. Well, last week alone, they went from uh, water over roads to flooding concerns to uh, winter storm, back to flooding concerns today and patching over the weekend and patching, endless patching. Um, so the, the potholes and the roads are caused by the freeze thaw cycle. So the water trickles down into those gaps in the pavement and um, with the heavy truck traffic, that's, that's part of it. That's a component, definitely. Um, those, those potholes do arise. Uh, part of it too, again, I'll speak to the infrastructure gap and in that usually these roads they, you'd like to redo them every seven years. Um, we might do maybe one, two, three um, roads uh, annually as far as resurfacing. But when you when you do the math, <laughs> we got, I, I think, uh, around 40 sections of roads. Um, to get back to them every seven years on that routine isn't something that's that we're able to do. So I know we're looking to arm, you know, council with the, the data. Uh, with this road management plan to, to really go and advocate for those funds to make sure that we get out of this situation. Because again, it's not fair to the roads crew. Um, they're doing the best they can, but really we need to invest more into our roads uh, capital wise and to make sure that we're on a routine maintenance program. But that's the majority of what it, what it was uh, caused by. And Helen, I, I saw Helen's Facebook status. She hit it dead on. Climate change is kicking our butt in a lot of ways. Um, the storms are getting heavier. And, and these freeze thaw cycles are just kicking the crap out of our roads and they're seeing the outcome of that now, but uh, we're doing the best we can out there. And again, thanks to the roads crew and all the stuff that they're doing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for that, Mike. And I think that even further goes to the, the importance of, you know, as much as we can further advocate, uh, you know, for, for government funding in those pieces, there's always, you know, the timelines and timeframes and deadline, all those pieces, which ultimately take more time. I think it relies we have to look to rely on our own source revenue and what we can do. Because again, if we start to make and, and generate own source revenue, we can really turn these projects around quite quickly as opposed to constantly having to wait. So I just wanted to touch on those pieces, but I, I also see Wendy has her hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And thanks, Mike. I mean, I could talk about this all, all evening because it's, you know, it's one of those things, but I, I agree. I mean, the road crews are doing what they can. I mean, the guys are out there today. They were all morning in the rain and they were working, filling the holes. Unfortunately, the holes are all empty again because of the rain. So it's just this repetitive cycle going on. And, you know, I, I'm anxious to see this plan because I don't think third line's ever been done. It's, it's one of those roads that's always left off of the plan for whatever reason. But I'd really like us to see a concentrated effort on doing 
you know, majority of roads, because that is a priority, because I think we've fallen so far behind in getting them done, that many of them are getting beyond repair. I mean, the section on Cougar Road between second and third, I mean, that is a hazard. That's an accident waiting to happen because that, it's a terrible section of road by the bridge there. So that really needs work. And I don't know if there's anything that can be done in the interim besides the, um, I don't know, I don't know what you call them. I, um, when, you, when you do the patchwork, um, when you fill in the holes, if there's something else that can be done besides that, or is there some other tool that they can use so they actually pack it when they do that? Will that make it last longer? Um, not sure, but if there's any other technology that we can be looking at, you know, can we start doing that in the interim? Something to uh, deal with the issue. Thanks, uh, thanks, Wendy. Sorry, Mike. Did you want to maybe just just uh, provide any response potentially for interim solutions? Yeah, for sure. So they that the the material they put in there is cold patch. Um, definitely here the the tamping. So there's something they they use as a tamper. It's quite heavy, and with all the with all the holes, I guess on a on a, on a section of road, it it becomes a bit it, it becomes incredibly almost impossible to for them to use that so they use the vehicles um we do have a a trailer we can heat up different kind of used asphalt and put it in there maybe that's a that's a solution but again um once we get out of this crazy cycle we're in maybe we can look at doing something definitely um as well as six line the western portion the gravel portion i know that's been brought up as well so we're we're well aware of these different things working with the bus companies, working with residents. So uh, to, to address these problems as they arise, but, you know, just to share a story when I came on, um, there was, there were different reports around uh, needing, needing to needing a lot of bridge work and uh, going around the office there. I couldn't, I couldn't really find an answer as to what had been done. So very early on, it became a, a difficult choice between, you know, do we repair a bridge that needs to be repaired or do we re road resurfacing? You know, the all all our capital money is kind of mixed in, so it becomes difficult. But we're we're getting better. Our our, our bridge network is uh, well maintained, and it's getting there. We've done three bridge replacements in the last eight years. You know, partnering with the MTO and different things. So there are a lot of opportunities out there, and uh, this council's done very well at advocating for for these needs. So we're we're going to close this gap and hopefully look back on this as kind of with a smile on our face. Say, I could remember the time when the roads were blowing up. <laughs> and uh, really appreciate what we have, but it's going to take a bit of time to get there and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work as hard as we can to help. Thanks. Uh, Mark? Uh, well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for, for your response. I have a couple of hands being raised. I'll first go over to Helen and then over to Michelle. Can I bring up my six line um, thing while he's here? Sure. <laughs> six sure. line, Makes Michael. <laughs> um, you know, I feel sorry people having to deal with potholes on the paved roads, but you need to drive down six line. Your road is very good compared to six line. Six line would love to have a pavement road with potholes. Um, it's a terrible road. It's terrible, terrible. And I've been fighting for this road for 17 years and I'm getting tired. I feel sorry for the people living there, um, having to drive on that daily i just i want something to get done with that this year something to get done those people deserve a good decent road we all got decent roads those people deserve decent roads so I'm really hoping if Mike's bringing the road plan, I'm hoping it's six lines at the top of the list of your road plan. So I guess I would ask you if that might be the case. Are they gonna be on the priority list for your road plan? Thanks, Thanks Helen, for bringing that up. I'll shift over to, uh, to, uh, to Michael for a response. And I guess while we're at it, we might as well throw all them we must throw them all at Wendy's Road, Cayuga Road, Seventh the River Wendy Range. And Cuba, Wendy's Road and Cayuga Road are paved. Yeah. Six line isn't well, even well, paved. River Range, 
<laughs> down below a little barely, bit. Barely, Helen. Barely. <laughs> yeah, uh, just Michael. Over to you. Yeah, so I've driven all the roads re very recently. Again, you know the the roads foreman's very great at providing updates as to you know you gotta check this out. It's blowing up. So I've been down those roads as recently as the weekend, um, all of them, and I, I do agree they all need work. And Helen, to your point, um, they are that road in particular, the gravel portion of six line is it's we have money set aside, it's scheduled, we have a contract in place, it's going to be service treated. Um, this paving season. It was supposed to be surface treated this last season, but uh, just schedules didn't align for the contractor. So it got pushed back. Uh, we're working with the, there's a family there that had an issue with the bus, bus company saying they didn't want to go down yeah. there. We've been in touch with uh, Sharp. I, I had had a conversation. Where'd you go? Where'd he go? Oh, sorry, Mike, you, we lost your audio. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. In regards to the bus company, I had a conversation with them this morning. That was a misunderstanding. Um, they're going to be continuing to, to pick up the kids. They're not going to leave kids not picked up down that road. And uh, it's important for people to understand uh, it's, it's impossible for us to maintain the road if it's frozen or if it's saturated uh, because putting a large machine on it um, when it's saturated is just going to cause major ruts. So uh, it's, it's kind of a, please be patient with us uh, type of situation. And we're definitely monitoring it and we'll get on it and grade it as soon as humanly possible. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Mike. It, really, that's the key word is please be patient and drive with caution, I think, uh, as we can maneuver through <laughs> defining our interim solutions here. <laughs> uh, know that we are taking this very seriously, community, uh, and getting as many roads as we can and supporting Michael and the road crew as best as we can to get those get those uh, finished. I just want to check in with Michelle. I had Michelle in queue next, and then over to Audrey, and then we'll look to vote on this motion. It's been moved and seconded already. Over to you, Michelle. I am. Um, I just wanted to share, because at BNI, this has come forward. I do believe six line residents knew their, their rule was to get fixed last year, but it is this year. And Mike, I, I want to make sure that when we had to redo the bridge on Chiefs, when third line was the detour, but it is in line this spring to be paved, correct? Yep. That those all the roads that were mentioned are top of the list. I um, perfect. I kind of I kind of feel overly prepared, but that was when we did their planning on Friday. Those are the three roads that were mentioned. The three roads that were mentioned here because of their state. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, Mark, uh, and Michelle I just that. wanted to make one more Over comment, Mark. Um, sure. Uh, ahead, change, change my road by Steyer's Lumber there, Mike, where those guardrails are. That road's going to cave in pretty soon. Is any work going to be getting done there somehow? If you I drive like, down Kingswood, you'll know that there's a big dip there, right? Yeah, I feel I'm, like a, I'm afraid that's going to cave in one of these days. I feel like a rock star here because I'm headed. I'm head again for this. Doesn't happen at all, but uh, it's my lucky day, I guess. But that was actually supposed to be resurfaced as well this last year. And it got put off due to contractor scheduling, but we actually have a contract signed and work scheduled this summer for that specific point of road. So from the north leg of a bicentennial trail, just by housing, the housing office up to the intersection of fifth line, that's all going to be redone oh, this summer. Good. So a lot of, lot of paving this summer. Uh, I know it doesn't do anything to address issues now, but it's, it's in the works to get done in the summertime. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, over to you, Audrey. Thank you very Can much. Can I be in line, Mark Melba? Yeah, I hear you, Melba. I first of all, I want to commend you, Mike, and all the roads crew. I think you guys do an amazing job. <clears throat> but I also want to echo with the uh, six line. I've had calls, texts, and pictures sent to me from the flooding on six line. I discussed with uh, this with Mike on the weekend, and it's happened again. Water's over the, the road. There have even been some uh, community members go down and try and uh, dig out the ditches and drain the ditches and the culverts. And so I think solutions have to be looked at why this keeps happening. Do we need bigger culverts there? Do we need to try and find a drainage down towards the river so that you can help uh, all the water run away from that area? And that's um, uh, between number 12 school and down to, um, I guess, um, 
around the to the bend going towards west towards Brantford. So I think that really needs to have, have a good look at it, even for structure and flooding and having the water run towards the river better. Yeah. Well. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for, for bringing those forward uh, in your comments as well. Uh, over to you, Melba. Yes, concerning shoulders of the road, I've noticed this over the years. And this year, as, as was said, this, one of, this is one of the worst. It's got to do, of course, as Helen said, climate change. I'm just wondering uh, how that can be rectified a little better than it is. How can how can that can be more strong and secure? I know there's soil there, there's stones there. How does that work? Because there's many potholes that are along the shoulder and cars attempt to avoid them and go toward the center line. So it's extremely dangerous. How can that how can that be rectified better than it is? Over to you, Mike. Okay, thanks. Just, just to Audrey's point there, I know that we're doing a lot of work as a subcommittee to the Environment Committee for the task force, just to look at flooding, where it's happening, what our plan is, and making sure that everything's documented so that we can you know, provide a fulsome plan for all these issues because uh, with all the rainfall and the flooding, there's been a number of areas that have been identified that are, need to be addressed. Um, just in regards to the road shoulders, so there's an exercise we do in the spring. We use a reclaimer or, or a piece of equipment and uh, make sure that we're promoting positive drainage away from the shoulders of the road. But again, um, it's that infrastructure gap that's really problematic and becomes an issue. So uh, just going back to that overall road management plan that we can you know table for, for council in the community, just so you're aware what the strategy is uh, so we can get to a better place as far as our road infrastructure. Yeah, hello, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your responses, Mike. I know we kind of went a little bit uh, off track here in relation to our motion. However, it's all related. Uh, but also, too, just want to acknowledge the chat. Uh, I know this is put in from Councillor Wendy that there are still three roads unpaved and we need to address all of them River Road, Seventh Line, Oneida Road. So, obviously, we're also uh, we're so excited to see this big master plan, Mike, as you can tell, and, and start to get all of these, these roads addressed. But again, we have to commend uh, you know, the road work crew and, and all others uh, doing this important and keeping us all safe, really. You know, they went from right from plowing all throughout the night to, like you say, you're looking to flooding roads to patching potholes, like they 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 deserve some some recognition here. So I want to do that, continue to do that. Shout out to the roads crew and your staff at Public Works. So thank you so much. Uh, okay, I'll look back to the motion then, Council. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any further questions or comments? 6C. Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. I'll look now to recommendation 6D, which is basically waiving uh, second reading from all three previous motions. I is there a mover to waive second reading? Audrey, I move. Moved by Audrey. Seconder. Was I on that one? Second. Uh, no, can. you weren't, Michelle, but would you like to? <laughs> second by Michelle yeah. to waive second reading on the three previous motions. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, well, thank you, Nyawa and Mike, for joining us this evening. Looking forward to that master plan. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks Have for your patience, day. community. You too. Take care. Uh, okay, Council, that leads us into our next portion, which is under scheduling. Uh, then we'll get into new business. Uh, we do, looks like, need a motion uh, for Sh Councilor Sherry Lynn to attend the Gaming Commission retreat. Uh, March 18th through the 20th in Niagara Falls. Looks like we're slowly getting into an endemic here. So it looks like now that's a lot better. We will also just know we will be back in person uh, meeting in the uh, in the chambers in early beginning of March is the goal date. 
Uh, so we'll look to get uh, all that back as well. So looking to a motion for Sherry Lynn. In fact, actually, Sherry Lynn, I'd like to attend with you if, if I could, just with the um, with the different uh, items happening within gaming. So if we can yeah. get one for myself, Sherry Lynn. Oh, yeah, and I'll let um, I'll let Mel know. Perfect. Um, okay. Is there is there a mover and seconder to that effect? Me too. I want to go. <laughs> I'm not sure then goes. Wendy, are you are you are you interested in attending? Because as we move to the portfolio structure, <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, thank you. All right, appreciate that. Thank you. Is there a, mo a mover and seconder to that effect for Sherry Lynn and I to attend the gaming commission retreat? I'll move again. Okay. Move by Michelle. Seconder. Second by Wendy. <laughs> All in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, thank you for that, Council. Uh, obviously, I hope everyone had a great family day yesterday. Uh, we're currently in General Council this evening. We have a Development Corp tomorrow as well, a meeting tomorrow at 5 p.m. Council, moving in uh, towards the uh, beginning of March. So our last uh, meeting of February will be a political liaison on February 28th. So we have quite the packed agenda for that meeting as well. And then moving into March uh, will be our human services meeting into the uh, following week of general finance and our second, uh, our first general council of March. Uh, and then our building and infrastructure. So that is our scheduling. I know there's a few other meetings on uh, our each of our schedules as well that will we'll need to get added. Um, and so we'll look to those as well. I am, I do have at this point in time, I will shift over to uh, additions to the agenda. So we've taken care, uh, Helen had added three. We've taken care of one of those, which was six line road. Uh, so we'll now start uh, with natural gas. I believe we have representative Mr. Williams and Mrs. Ms. Tracy here joining us this evening on natural gas. Um, but that, with that being said, I did have a prior commitment and I've already conversed with uh, Councillor Wright, Nathan, who will assume chair as, uh, at this time. So thank you so much, Nathan, and I'll pass the floor right over to yourself uh, to introduce the new business item, the first one being the natural gas. Thank you to everybody and I hope you have a great evening. Thanks, Steve. Uh, can I uh, indulge council for a motion? I'll move to have Nathan chair. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Good night. By post, <laughs> Gary. Thanks, Sherry Lynn. Okay, uh, Council, so what I'll do is um, we have two items left on um, natural gas as well as Iroquois Lodge. So just a quick, uh, Helen, did you want to introduce this topic or just turn it over to uh, Tracy and uh, Steve? You're on mute, by the way. I wasn't aware Tracy. I wasn't aware Tracy and Steve were going to be here. So, I'll just introduce why I'm bringing up natural gas. I guess, of course, everybody must know it's probably over the natural gas bills. I've been getting a lot of calls from people, uh, and I can even raise my own concern about my bill. Everybody's really concerned because the gas usage is so low, but the bill is so high. Like, for example, with my own bill, my gas usage was 92 and my bill is 320. Um, and I noticed that it's, it's gotten higher. I'm, and I'm told by Tracy that's because the, it was so cold in January and it's going to be high again in February because it's cold. But there's a whole process with the delivery and the transport too and the, that needs to be addressed. And... Um, the red, what's it called? Red, what's that tax called? Red something? Carbon reduction plan. Yeah, red reduction plan. That's a carbon tax. That's a carbon tax. And uh, it goes up depending on how much gas you use because everybody's tax is different. It's not the same thing. So that really needs to be explained to people. And I really think council needs to start fighting that to try and get that off of the gas bills. I know um, Tracy had mentioned that they had gotten a lawyer before to try and fight that 
carbon tax. But the lawyer said, because it's not called a tax, we can't be exempt from it, but it is a tax. They just call it by something different. So I'm sitting on that greenhouse gas uh, pricing committee for the Chiefs of Ontario. And I've been sitting on that going on to three years, but it kind of went off the rails when COVID started. So they're bringing it back up again. And that committee is working on trying to get exemption from uh, that tax applying on reserves. So I think council really needs to push that 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 tax, that part of the the bill. And I think we can probably try and work on pushing the transport. That's Enbridge that's charging the transport. It used to be Union Gas, but it's Enbridge now. I think we can work on trying to push that one, but the delivery too is something that the gas company needs to support the gas company. So we you know, we don't really want to bother with that one, I guess, but um, everybody's really upset and, and I'm worried about our elderly people that are living on limited incomes and their gas bills are going up so high like that. We need to figure out how we can maybe help people. I know the elderly can use the senior relief fund, but that's once a year and your gas bills come in every month. This is the highest my gas bill has ever been since I lived here. It's 320. And of course I got this big garage next door, but still it was never that high. So it's really noticeable this month. And I know a lot of people are, you know, they, they blame council, they're blaming uh, the gas company and I think it's really important for people to really understand what it's all about because I don't think a lot of people do. So I had talked to Tracy about, you know, coming to council to do that, but I didn't know she was going to be here tonight. But starting to promote and put maybe put something in the paper for people to read. And there's also a, a website, sixnationsnatgas.com where you can look up and see the frequently asked questions. And there's a lot of explanation on there for people that want to know what's going on. They can do that on their own if they have a computer. So we got to really get start getting out to the community. And, and I know the natural gas people that work, they get abused too, because people are, you know, hollering, hollering at them and getting after them about the gas. And there's nothing they can do because they're staff doing their jobs. And I'm assuming they probably have to get, put up with the same things as public work staff. Public work staff is always getting hollered at and getting blamed for everything too, but they're all, it's only part of their job and that's what they're doing. Their staff that's doing their jobs and they're, and they're not to blame. The same as the natural gas people. So anybody listening today, I'm hoping that you know, you're, you're not blaming the, the natural gas staff because they're only doing their jobs. The, the issues with the bill starts at the high up level. So we need to do something about trying to fix that. So I'm glad Steve and Tracy are here. So I'll let them have the floor. Thanks, Helen. Um, a couple, just, just before I go to Tracy and, and Steve, um, one of the things that would have been beneficial to this conversation was a, a briefing and a, and a kind of outline of, of what those issues are. And, and not to say you didn't do a good job kind of bringing, bringing those issues out, but um, you know, just for the fairness of councillors, they don't have anything to absorb at this point um, in, yeah. in terms of the, the piece. and, and um, I think what we have to do is is listening to the presentation from Tracy and Steve today, uh, but uh, we need to formally put this on the agenda with a briefing, uh, with the information, uh, well, so that we can do our strategic planning as well. So, um, at, and, and I'm not going. Uh, I'm still going to go to Tracy uh, and and Steve to hear what they have to say, uh, but we need we need the information I, as well. Yeah, I just uh, well, I just wanted to say I wasn't. I wasn't aware they were going to be here, and the only all I had planned to do was raise it, raise the issue of the cat of the gas bills, 
they disappeared. Raise the, I was only going to raise the issue of the gas bills and make the suggestion that we get Tracy and Steve here for the next council meeting. That's okay. why I didn't bring any big briefing notes or nothing, but it turned out differently, like they're here and I didn't know they were going to be here. Otherwise, right. it would have different. Perfect. Okay, I hear you. Um, before we get to the presentation, I'm going to go to uh, Wendy Johnson. She has her hand up. Thanks, Nathan. And, and thanks, Helen. This is a huge and I think it's, you know, it's huge to the community. And I think rather than having, you know, it's, I appreciate that Tracy and Steve are here, but I think we should promote a meeting, a public meeting with council so that community is well aware of it and they can ask questions and have the information and, and do it, do it properly. I think you covered all the items or all the pieces, Helen, but I think moving forward, if we can get it on the agenda as you originally um, thought and, and go that way. Because I just think we can have this discussion, but community, you know, may not be aware of it and may not be participating right now. So this is my thoughts. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, so uh, I, I I am hearing that we need to put this on a future agenda with with proper briefings and the information. But uh, while we have Steve and, and Tracy here, uh, love to hear your thoughts in preparation of the those meetings. So some short comments in that relation, understanding that uh, we're going to formally put this on the agenda uh, at a future meeting, uh, as kind of Wendy and and Helen have outlined. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Um, yes, we. If if I, I thought maybe we were gonna, I thought maybe Helen was gonna put us on the agenda, and I got her email and everything else, and met with Tracy, and she said it was coming to council tonight. So I just assumed it was on the agenda. If it's not, that's fine. We can always come back. I know Tracy wants to speak because she puts stuff together for Helen. So Tracy, want to explain everything? Hi. Good evening. Um, so I, I do understand that um, the community does have concerns regarding the cost of the natural gas bills. Um, in January, and like Helen said, February, you are going to see an increase because it's the amount of gas that you use. In January, the cost of the gas, the commodity, went up about two cents. Um, this is the first increase since 20... 21 and prior no 2018 so 2018 19 and 20 2018 19 20 and 21 our gas commodity was around nine cents per cubic meter prior to that in 2016 to 21 the gas was actually three to seven cents higher than it is right now right now it's uh, around 11 cents per cubic meter. And back in 2014, 15, it was 18 cents per cubic meter. Our delivery charges, what, what is the, um, the funds that natural gas uses to operate, that's been a solid 13 and a half cents since 2012. Our transportation, um, it's kind of been fluctuating. It's going up probably around one and a half to two cents per year. Um, but again, in 2017, 18, 19, and 20, it kind of stayed around the seven and a half cents. So really, the only reason why people's bills are so high is the amount of natural gas they're using. And prices really aren't going, coming down. Um, the energy markets are really a bit more sensitive right now. And it's it's um, kind of due to the crisis that's happening uh, between Russia and Ukraine. So we're not gonna see a decrease. It's probably gonna be an increase um, in our commodity. We don't plan on changing the 13 and a half cents, but the commodity, which is the gas use, the transportation and the carbon reduction plan, those are all straight direct in and out charges. Basically what we're charged, we charge the customer. The 13 and a half cents and the 625 is the funds that natural gas uses to operate. Um, and, and please know that we are responsible to pay for um, any natural gas consumed by customers who 
aren't paying their bills. So that 13 and a half cents, any customer who's not paying their bill, we still have to pay that 100%. And the carbon reduction plan that, um, like Helen said, it is con basically considered a tax and that's a political issue. That's something that we can't touch. Um, and if we don't pay it, we don't get gas. And if, if natural gas covers that, we're, we basically can't afford to cover that. Thanks for that, Tracy. Um, and, and as you did the presentation, I see a greater need for a presentation and visuals so, so that we can uh, consume uh, a lot of that information uh, in terms of the, um, the derivative and, and how we can strategically plan going forward. So um, do apologize uh, just for the, the kind of miscommunication and, and the agenda items. Um, we'll definitely uh, work with the chief's office to reach out to you uh, for a future council meeting where we can get a presentation, some visuals, and have a good discussion on how to strategically plan for this um, going forward. Um, so if there's no more further questions, uh, I'm going to um, ask that that be done. Uh, I'll talk to the chief's office and we'll follow up for a future meeting because I think the information you provided was valuable. Uh, and uh, I think this will set up a, a valuable conversation with visuals, with a presentation and, and uh, a good discussion on the strategic planning going forward. Okay, sounds great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council, for listening to us. So yes, we'll, we'll come, certainly come back. Appreciate that. Uh, Sherilyn. Can we have some solutions or from from Tracy? Like what can we do or those kinds of things also? That would be good. Thanks. I honestly, Sherilyn, I don't see any solutions other than the fact that be transparent. Um, Helen did have a good suggestion of uh, posting in the local papers. Um, so what I did was I did prepare a mock bill, like a sample bill, kind of itemizing each charge and stating what it's for. I think if customers were aware that there was direct in and out charges, they're being charged what we're charged, I think they'd be more understanding. And I think if they did know that the 13 and a half cents that Six Nations Natural Gas uses to operate has been the same since 2012, I think they would be more understanding. Okay, we do thanks. Have oh, sorry. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I, I think was, again, um, what I was suggesting is I think collectively we can do some strategic planning once visually we see some of the, um, the breakdown of, of the, not only the percentages, the fact and, and where things are coming from, but uh, have a good robust discussion on some solutions we can present to the community going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Tracy, and thanks, Steve. Uh, Helen, uh, your um, final issue was, uh, I believe, air collage. And you're also on mute, sorry. I got a call that some of the rooms in the air, couple of rooms are, are so in the air collage are flooding. And a family member was upset, I guess, because they're their family had to be moved to a different room and there was, you know, there was nothing in there for them. So they were wanting to know what council, why is council letting the Iroquois Lodge flood and what's council doing about it and why don't we use our money to fix it? And I wasn't even aware that Iroquois Lodge was flooding. And I informed the, per, you know, person, the people that phoned me that I, council, as far as I knew, council wasn't aware that Iroquois Lodge was flooding. So we need to look, get somebody to look into that. Um, if the air collage is flooding, I do feel a bit, I guess, upset that we weren't informed. Um, just in the, in the case, in the sense that we might be getting phone calls like I did. I didn't know what to say to the person. I just had to say that I wasn't aware of it. Well, you should be aware of those kinds of things. So, um, I guess there's a bit of a miscommunication there someplace. So I just wanted to bring that to council's attention in case anybody gets phone calls. And somebody, I guess, Darren, or someone needs to look into it. Is there quite large flooding? 
and why? Like, I don't recall the lodge ever flooding before, but I'm, I can't be sure. It may have. So that's a concern. Um, oh, for, for sure, Helen. And, and thanks for so bringing up. Is Darren board. here? Yeah, he has his hand up. So if uh, if it's okay, I can go to him. Yes, uh, thank you. And I know uh, Sherry Lynn, uh, part of this uh, action as well, she brought the concerns to me. I forwarded on to Janet Gasparelli, Laurie Davis Hills on vacation, and she followed up directly with Andy, um, who's the administrator. Yes, there has been some flooding and they worked with the fire department to rectify the situation. It's because of the excessive, um, <laughs> I mean, everybody's experiencing it, right? Um, and we had actually an infrastructure committee meeting today as well, talking about a lot of our facilities were not built for flood um, proofing in a sense. Uh, I know Mike's on, on the call still. So we did talk about that today. And, and I think the other thing going, going forward is that we make sure that we our designs are have that in mind. And we do have we do have uh, some movement in, on, in terms of a new lodge coming forward here short, shortly. So so some good news there, but doesn't doesn't take away from the fact that it should have, should have been communicated sooner. So certainly, uh, we moved on it right away and um, they have been able to mitigate the situation and they have a, a list of supports to assist them should it continue. Um, so I'll just, maybe I'll stop there. I know Sherilyn, maybe Sherilyn has a comment, but um, as far as Janet was good in responding and they're very aware of the situation and they're monitoring it closely. I don't know the cause of it specifically, but um, they're working with people on the ground to, to resolve any of those issues as they arise. Thanks, Darren. And I do see Sherry Lynn with her hand up, so I'll go to Sherry Lynn. Um, yeah, that came to my attention this morning regarding this. And just everything that um, Darren said, uh, the only thing I can uh, um, add to it is um, Janet stated that um, she'll consult with Public Works to see what um, we can do to prevent this in the future. That, that's the only thing that um, add to that. But again, you know, um, this is the first time I heard about it too. So <laughs> we need some more communication. I felt awkward also. I didn't know that it was happening or that it did happen. So yeah, so better communication. And um, that's what I know where it's at with what Darren said and that they're going to talk to um, Public Works regarding that. Yeah, thanks, Sherry Lynn. And um, just so you, you're aware, when you brought it to my attention is the first I heard of it too. So obviously there's an issue with bringing these kind of, these are like emergency situations. You know, they need to be, there needs to be a threshold when it's like this kind of situation, it needs to be communicated. So appreciate uh, the, the quick response on all, all accounts. Thanks, Darren, uh, Sherry Lynn and Helen for bringing that really important issue forward and, and definitely need to underscore that communication piece uh, not only to, to council, but also to the families and the community when these occur. So really appreciate the work and follow-up. It was quick, um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also hearing we got some monitoring and some work to do into the future. So with that, um, council, that brings us to the end of the um, open agenda. Um, if there's no other comments, I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Sherry Lynn. Seconded by Helen, all in favor? See none opposed, so that motion has passed. Thank you community uh, and uh, have a, a great evening and stay safe.